So when people think of steam engines, they usually think of something like this. But today, we are going to take a look at this. We are not only going to see the assembly of this engine, but we will also find out why it works by looking inside the cylinder and inside the valve. And finally, we will fire up the boiler and check out if this thing actually runs. To see how tiny our machine actually is, let's compare it to this 1887 Kimse locomotive. And these are the parts we are going to assemble. Okay, let's get to the assembly. Here we have the piston rod cylinder assembly. We have a valve and a screw to mount it. Um, let's take a look. Here we have the steam inlet and that leads to this hole here. And on the other side, this hole leads to the exhaust port. And there are two other holes, uh, a bit darker. This one leads to the lower and on the other side to the upper part of the cylinder. Therefore pushing the piston up or down. And we can take a closer look um, to see how this is working by putting some oil on these holes. You will see if I push the piston in that the air is escaping from that hole up there. And if I pull it out, air is escaping from the opposite side. So basically this is a double action cylinder. And with this ingenious design of a valve, um, where you can see these channels milled into it, and this is a rotational valve, um, you can make sure that the steam inlet either goes to the upper or the lower side of the cylinder. And correspondingly, the exhaust port is connected to the other side so that the piston can uh, move uh, up and down. And we will now also put the valve plate, uh, how it should be attached with the screw. And to just make sure that it doesn't uh, let steam out through the valve, there is a spring attached to the screw. I think the screw is a metric uh, 1.5, M1.5 thread size. So we will screw this together now. Yeah, and here I can now move the valve. I think you get the idea. If I move the valve by 45 uh, degrees, you can see that uh, the connections will alternate between steam inlet and exhaust port to either part of the cylinder. We will attach now a mounting um, a, yeah, mounting part here that mounts later onto the beam. This is screwed in with an M1. It's a very, very, very tiny one millimeter screw. I'm testing if uh, everything moves freely. That's very important that the piston inside the cylinder can move freely. I'm also testing that uh, everything is kind of sealed because I'm blocking the air from the exhaust um, uh, port here and uh, vice versa then from the steam inlet. Okay, everything seems to be fine. We will now connect the base plate with the piston rod cylinder assembly. So on the base plate, you can see the initials L and H. These stand for Lutz Hilscher, the name of the guy who originally designed this uh, steam engine kit. Uh, nicely made out of very nice materials like this shiny brass. We will use um, M2, metric M2 millimeter screws here to uh, screw everything together. It's very beautiful. I really love it because not only that brass is so shiny after you polish it, but also because of this homogeneous materials we have here, uh, we are not running into electrochemical reactions which may, uh, you know, corrode this and make this thing look a bit ugly after a while. Anyway, I'm also uh, wiping away my fingerprints. 
Yeah, and since we have a beam steam engine, we need, of course, a beam. And that's the part you see here on the upper part of the image. And below is the column. This is the central column, also beautifully uh, designed here. And um, I'm using a screw. I think this is the M1.5 tiny brass screw to put this together. Now we will attach this assembly to the base plate. Make sure that the beam is actually connected to the piston attachment. And again, here we will use an M1.5 uh, screw, a brass screw. Beautiful, beautiful. Make sure everything is fastened correctly. Yeah, and I also really like, you know, when I'm assembling things to always test it, you know, at every different point. Okay, the next thing is the flywheel, the crank and uh, the crankshaft support. And we will run the crankshaft through its support and, and on the opposing side at the crank. And this is um, attached with a set screw that we are screwing in here. Very, very delicate, tiny piece. And yeah, we see that the flywheel can freely move. This is perfect. And now we will attach this uh, also with an M1.5 uh, brass screw to the base plate. Okay. So. Now we test it again, if everything is fine. We need to attach now with a connection rod, the crank and the beam. This is a little bit of a bit more complex part here. And uh, this time we will use washer plates uh, just to make sure that the movement can be smooth and unobstructed. Now attaching the connection rod to the beam is a little bit tricky because inside the notch we want to also place a washer just to make sure that everything moves very very smoothly and this is a little bit tiny and I'm really trying to get this together with an M1 um, very very tiny one millimeter screw and on the other side again a washer and then we fasten everything with a nut okay so now basically uh, yeah just after testing it again if everything so far moves freely um, also is the valve still okay I'm testing it um, we will now attach the last remaining thing of, of these kinematics here, uh, which is an eccentric rod. So we have to connect the valve to the crank. That's still missing because we want the valve to alternate um, the pathway of the steam as well as the exhaust. So this is attached here with a little bit of a rubber pipe. Um, very, very small. That works fine and uh, later on uh, so we can change the position of the uh, eccentric rod to change the direction of the rotation that's why we are not screwing it together like all the other pieces i'm already using oil here because it's easier um, i figured to attach these tiny things they don't move so freely anymore as if there wouldn't be any oil uh, kind of yeah, putting it together or having this little bit of adhesion in there. Here I'm using again a, uh, I think this is an M1 screw and this is the last piece of the main mechanism we need to put together. Here you can see the final screw <laughs> getting into the connection rod.
Yeah, and finally we want to put everything together to the big main base plate. This is made out of sheet metal. And we want to attach the steam mechanism to the condenser or the uh, condensing water collection tank uh, up there, also made out of um, brass. And we are attaching this with another brass screw. We are using these uh, distance pieces to have a little bit of uh, distance between the steam mechanism and the main base plate. We're using, I think this is M1.5 uh, size screws and uh, some nuts to fasten it from the other side. Yeah, so now the steam mechanism is attached to the main base plate here. And now, finally, the only thing which is still missing is the steam generation. We of course need steam for a steam engine. So here I'm uh, attaching the steam pipe, which will guide the steam to the cylinder. And this one will attach to the boiler. Uh, we will seal it with a little bit of a rubber ring. There you go. And this is the boiler. It also acts as a water level gauge because it's made out of glass, so we can always monitor the water level. We don't want it to run dry. And here I'm going to attach the final piece of the puzzle, which is a decorative chimney, just for design purposes, basically. And here it is, the final finished steam engine. One final test of all the parts that can run freely. Everything is fine. And let's enjoy some moving images of the finished model. So let's fire up the boiler to see if this tiny machine actually runs. First, I'm using a syringe to fill the glass boiler with distilled water. And distilled water uh, is better because tap water, especially hard water, has a very high mineral content of calcium and magnesium carbonates and sulfates and stuff like that. And we don't want those things to clog up the brass pipes. And for heating up the water, instead of using coal, as in a traditional steam locomotive, we will just use a standard lighter with an extension pipe. We are burning butane gas, and this metallic object below the glass bulb is the tip of the lighter pipe. Uh, the flame is a bit hard to see in this picture, but you can see its reddish orange flickering below the boiler. And as the water evaporates into steam, the pressure is building up in the boiler and the connected pipes. And at this point, we can start to give the flywheel a bit of a spin. And here you go. The kind of jerky movement that you see in the beginning on the first few rotations comes from the fact that the piston does not actually produce a constant torque. It's more like a pulsating torque for each cycle. And we need the inertia of the flywheel to even this out. So we have an almost constant rotation after a few rotations, after the inertia takes full effect. Now this footage was actually slowed down from 120 frames per second to 24, so five times slower than reality. So we can see all the details in the motion. In a few moments, you will see this in real time and you will also be able to hear the sound of it. So the same footage again in real time. Here you go.
But how do we get the piston to move in the first place? And how do we get a periodical motion out of it? To find out, let's take a look at a 3D CAD model. And to better understand, I have made the valve and the cylinder transparent. You have to know that the cylinder is a double action cylinder, meaning that both the uh, movement of the piston upwards and downwards are actually active. To see better what's going on, let's hide the valve. And we can see here that the steam comes in through this red arrow from the left, uh, comes out through this hole here. And this cavity leads to the uh, condenser. And then we have this channel that leads to the upper part of the cylinder and that one to the lower. So if we want to move the piston down, we need to inject steam here. But how do we achieve that? So for that, we have the valve and the valve alternates basically between those two positions, between these double actions. So in this state, the valve connects the steam coming from the left to the upper part of the cylinder. And in this position here, it does the exact opposite. So the steam goes in through the lower part of the cylinder and pushes the piston up. Now let's take a look at it through this animation. What is really important to achieve this is we need to have a phase shift between the crank position or the crank angle and the valve angle. This is really important because if you would have both the crank and the valve angle so exactly at the same position, the whole thing would not move at all. So when the piston is actually moving fastest in the middle of the cylinder, then the valve is stationary and if the piston reaches the end of the cylinder or the end of its position stroke, that means that the valve is then changing the position. So this is achieved by a 90 degrees angle or, or phase shift. Now, but where do we get the 90 degrees from? So if we look at the crank, we could of course uh, change the connection rod position where it connects to the crank, shift by 90 degrees and there attach the eccentric rod. But if you look at the design of this machine, you can see that the cylinder is already to the left or 90 degrees shifted by position uh, relative to the connection rod. So we have our 90 degree angle already in this design. And talking about this, you may have guessed it already. So how do we achieve a change of the rotation direction of the flywheel? Now that is done by a 90 degrees phase shift to the other direction. So compared to the current setup, a 180 degrees shift of the angle of the valve relative to the crank angle. In this design, there are several ways how to do it. We could of course attach the eccentric rod on the opposite side of the connection rod on the crank. But an even easier way is to achieve the exactly same thing by shifting the valve connection point or just rotating the valve actually by 180 degrees. And that's what we're going to do. Here it is. And this is, at least in theory, rotating the flywheel in the opposite direction. So let's try this out in reality and see if it actually works. And here you go. We are approaching the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you had a good time, maybe learned a few things. And if you did, please consider to hit like and subscribe. See you next time.